Let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Lee for, uh, to give us the VASC seminar today. Uh, Andrew is a senior professor of computer science at UIUC. And before joining UIUC in 2023, uh, he was a postdoc at Stanford working with uh, Jia Jun Wu and Fei Fei Li. And he got a PhD from MIT called West by Antonio Toroba and the Ross Tetrick. And Rinju has received a lot of awards, including the Best System Paper Award and the finalist for Best Paper Award at, in a uh, conference on robot learning, Cora. And his works has been reported by a lot of uh, media, such as CNN, uh, BBC, uh, uh, MIT Technology Review, uh, Economist, uh, et cetera. Uh, without further ado, let's welcome the speaker, give us this fantastic talk. So thank you, Guanya, uh, for the kind introduction and for the invitations. It's my great pleasure to come back again at CMU to talk about our some of our recent new work. And the topic of today's talk will be foundation models for robotic manipulations. I will discuss some opportunities as well as challenges lies ahead. So the goal of today's talk is that by the end of the talk, I hope you could be convinced that there are actually a lot of values from the current developments of foundation models. And we will be able to see some opportunities of their deployments in the robotic manipulation pipeline. So recently you have seen a lot of progress in the field of robotics, uh, in locomotion, in self-driving. But we still haven't received uh, robotic manipulation systems that can achieve human level manipulation capabilities, especially in the wild, in the unstructured environments. So for this kind of human level manipulation capabilities, like compared with what we currently have in the industry environment. What we have are manipulation systems, typically focusing on relatively simple pick and place tasks for relatively simple objects. Those are the current like commercial systems. Yet what we want the robot to do will be much more than that. We want the robots to work in this unstructured like household environments, offices environments, to work with objects that are of different type of dynamics, different types of materials. We also trying to generalize, of course, different kinds of instances within different kinds of categories. There's, if you look at these images, you actually realize there's a lot of like common sense understandings about the task, about the low level structure of the environments, as well as this high level planning about what the robot should do given the current task, as well as the current observations. So today I'm gonna dive into like, what are some of the interesting insights we could get from the existing foundation models and how those foundation models, those insights and common sense knowledge learned from these foundation models could be used in the robotic manipulation pipeline. Especially, I will discuss ways of building some kind of intermediate representations such that they can bridge the gap between the development of foundation models and the actual physical actions that can be executed on the robotic systems. So before we start to talk about how we use it, let's first think more carefully about the definition of what is a foundation model? I feel a lot of people have been using this foundation model to describe a lot of different types of models. Um, according to Wiki, a foundation model is a machine learning model that is trained on a broad data such that it can be applied across a wide range of use cases. So this is a rather vague definition. And currently, like there are a lot of models like GPT-4V, uh, Segment Anything, Dino. People just all call them like foundation models. But for example, if you are thinking about some visual foundation models, if you really like be restricted about it, you would expect these visual foundation models to do all the tasks you could imagine in computer vision. The, but we don't have that kind of models yet. Instead, we have a lot of like different foundation models for visions that are actually good for different things. But what they have in common is this very strong generalization capabilities that when you take a pictures using your phone, it can still give you very decent performance in generalizing outside to new scenarios and new images. So today I'm gonna use this broader definitions of foundation models regarding, for example, GPT-4V would be a foundation model and there will be different types of foundation models for visions. We'll discuss their potential use cases and the insights we could draw from them for robotic manipulation systems. So specifically today's talk, will be discussing opportunities on three major sub block. The first one will be task specification. Specifically, how we can harness the common sense information learned in those foundation models to communicate the task to the robots. I will then discuss 
what are some of the opportunities we could obtain, especially to give some low level modeling capabilities, how we can achieve some zero shots modeling of the environments that give us the right levels of generalizations, especially how we can ground them inside the 3D environments. And the third, I will discuss opportunities on high level modeling uh, process, especially at understanding the structures, the action conditions a relationship between the entities and objects within this environment. So this will be today's um, uh, talks overview. So let's start with task specification. Specifically, the question we hope to answer are twofold. Like what is a task for robotics and how to communicate the task for, to the robots? If you think about tasks in, for example, self-driving cars or drones, the task specification is rather straightforward. You just tell the robots where the destination is and the robot should go to that specific destination. But if you look at all the common like household tasks in our environments, describing the task to the robots wouldn't be, wouldn't be as straightforward. For example, you tell the robot to fold the clothes. What does that really mean? The clothes can be folded in many different ways. You tell the robot to make the table. The table can also be made in many different ways depending on what the user's preferences is. So in this case, there's actually a lot of common sense knowledge behind this one very simple instruction, like makes the table. And those kind of common sense information actually learned inside those foundation models. So you are trying to find a way to bridge the gap and harness those informations to command the robots to do different kind of tasks. Specifically, the tasks we are asking the robot to do is to command the robots using natural language to communicate the task using just like our language. And we want the robots to work and manipulate an open set of objects. Here are just some examples of, for example, like turn open the vitamin bottles, measure the weight of an apple, et cetera. So use language to command the robots to do different kinds of tasks is not new. And actually there has been a lot of developments, especially actually large scale like investigations in the industry, for example, from Google's. They have developed a series of work from Seiken, RT1, RT2s. Their general framework is looking like this. You have your language instructions. You have your visual observations. You want to map those informations into the robot actions. They have a lot of PRs. They have, they have been really like trying to uh, claim contributions in this field, which I think they have made definitely very, very, very valuable contribution. But if you really look at their performance, you will actually feel a, li a little bit of dissatisfied. First, this model obviously has amazing high level reasoning and recognition capabilities. But when it comes to their low level skills, you will be able to see this video. This is actually the first demos that's released on the RT2. For example, the task would be move Volkswagen to Germany. Obviously the recognition capabilities is amazing. But if you really look at how the robot is actually doing the task, you'll feel they can't even get the pick and place right. Another example is to move the other car to the US. Again, the recognition capability is amazing. It's just this low level uh, interaction capabilities is really not there. So foundation model is good at doing this high level reasoning, have this common sense interpretations of the task. And if they cannot do this low level interactions very well, why not we use some more uh, classic tools in robotics to actually bridge the gap. So specifically in this work, instead of doing everything end to end, we take this modularized approach. And the key insights to bridge the gap between foundation model and the robot actions is to use code as this intermediate representation. Code is actually a very nice representation because first, it is multilingual. It is simultaneously large language model generatable, human interpretable, and the robot executable. So this very nice intermediate interface would actually be a pretty like sweet ways to bridge their gaps. Specifically, here's how the systems could work. For example, given the visual observation and also the language instruction, the large language model will generate code describing the objective functions of the environment. Here, our objective function is represented as like a 3D voxel map. Like for example, here I'm showing it's a hundred by a hundred by a hundred voxel grid. And then the large language model will be able to generate code that call a vision language model to detect where the handles are inside this environment. In this case, there'll be two handles, but the task is to open the top drawer. 
So the large language model will be able to generate code that sort those handles according to their height, and then successfully select the top handle. And then we'll assign some values on the 3D locations of the top handles. And that value will be smoothed out over the entire 3D space to generate this affordance map that tells the robots where the end effector should go. And also at the same time, you might also want to tell the robots to watch out for the vase along the way. So the large language model will be able to generate some constraints map that also, again, called the vision language model of detecting where the vase is inside this environment. And then it will mark the location of that vase with some, for example, negative values. That essentially tell the robots, okay, you actually want to avoid that regions. And this smooth out constraint map and affordance map will be combined together with other like uh, maps, like rotation map, gripper maps, and velocity maps of telling the robots what the end effectors, six of end effector posts should be looking like. So this together will call it a value map, which essentially is a 3D objective functions for the robots to do motion planning. This is actually also very similar to potential fields um, in robotics. This maps composed together, then we can plan the robot's trajectories, like trying to traverse this environment, such that the trajectories, um, the sum of the values along those trajectories, uh, we hope that to be as high as possible. The planned trajectory can then be executed in the real world to open up the top drawer and also avoid waste along the way. So we have also deployed the similar systems um, into a wide range of real world manipulation tasks. Again, all of those trajectories are zero shots generated. And here are some basic articulated object manipulation tasks. Like for example, close the top drawer, turn on the lamp, and turn open the vitamin bottles. The last example, like one catch is that the, the bottle cap is already opened. So it doesn't really have to like squeeze very hard to open the uh, bottle cap. Here are some other basic deformable object manipulation tasks. For example, take out the napkins, sweep trash into the dustpan, and hang the towel on the rack. If you look at this example, it actually also involves a few intermediate steps. For example, first pick up the towels, and then place towel, and then drop it. And here are some other uh, many everyday manipulation tasks. For example, take out the bread from the toast and lay it flat on the board, or set the table for pasta, or measure the weight of an apple. So you can successfully recognize if we want to measure the weight of an apple, we should use a scale to measure its weights and we will successfully place the apple on top of that scale. And our systems can also be robust to external disturbance. For example, here is one example of sort the paper trash into the blue tray. But during the execution process, there'll be a person constantly perturbing the environment, preventing the robots from doing its job but the robot can still like constantly um, pick up the trash and then place onto the tray. I will later tell how we did it. Another example would be, for example, close the top drawer. After the robot closed the top drawer, the human again comes in and moves the drawers around. The robot can also close the top drawers even if there's external disturbance. We have also found some very interesting emergence behaviors during the way of doing the experiments. So I also want to share them with you. For example, after the robot has already set the table for the pasta, you can actually add some follow-up uh, information, like I'm actually left-handed. The robot knows it had to move the fork from the right side to the left side in order to do this more behavior common sense reasoning. Another one would be fine-grained language corrections. For example, here, the robot trying to close the lid of the pot, you can add a follow-up instruction, like you are actually off by one centimeter to the left. The robot knows it had to move the uh, the, the, the cap to uh, one centimeters to the right. The third example is actually quite interesting. The task is open the drawer precisely by half. Think about it, how you would actually do it before you open the drawer and how would you open the drawer precisely by half. The robots came up with a plan. They first open the drawer fully and push it back for half of the distance to accomplish this task of open the drawer precisely by half. So you, you might imagine, oh, it seems uh, great, it seems amazing. Like there's like language instructions, there's like a, um, configurations of the, of the current uh, setup and robot will be able to do all of those tasks. And actually all the magic 
are behind the information we supply to the foundation model. And all the magic would actually be in the prompts. So specifically, here are some example prompts we give to the large language model, specifically GPT-4V. And the inputs will be, again, a lot of like functions. And there will be like two key lines. The first line will be what are the objects in the environment. We give this information to the foundation models. So here you might notice we actually assume we have a fully observable environment. We recognize all the objects in the environments. The second line will be the query, like the specific task. For example, open the drawer slowly. And the eighth line to the tenth line are the prompts we give to the large language models. And to specify like what are the intermediate steps the robot should take to accomplish this task. And each line will be a composer. Each composer will correspond to this value maps we instantiated as I showed earlier. So we in total give the large language model 15 examples. And we evaluate the systems on more than 30 tasks that are different from what the robots was prompted with. And you could imagine it to be like a few short learning process. And this few short learning and generalization capabilities is really powered by the generalization capabilities of foundation models. People also call it in-context learning. Like I said earlier, the, uh, the robots can be robust to external disturbance. And this requires the robot to constantly detecting the objects in the environment, understanding their states before you can do the task. So here is how we did it. This is one example we give to the large language model that actually involves a while loop. This while loop will have this condition to check whether the napkin is close to the trash can. If their distance is far away than some pre-specified thresholds, it will continue to do the task like iteratively. So this is a prompt. Although the task we actually do will be different from this, but this shows that our um, systems can generate these programs. And this program can contain some while or for loops. This kind of loops can allow us to be robust to external disturbance. So any questions so far? Why is robots so slow? The videos were 8x. Uh, this is really due to the engineering practice. So in this case, our main selling point is not to work on very dynamic tasks. If you have noticed, a lot of those tasks mainly involve some peak and place or peak and pull type of motions. So for those type of motions, like uh, our current like slow objects can do those tasks uh, fairly well, but we believe with better engineering, like we could uh, do the task much faster. But in your introduction, you said one of your complaints is that robot skills are still very bad and moving so slowly is still very bad. You can't say, I now have a skillful robot. Uh huh. So in this case, like we do not intend to solve everything inside this work. This works may problems that we aim to solve will be this high level task communications. So uh, if we are building a company, of course, I like, will have to make everything like fast, smooth, and robust. It just in this case, we believe this slow robots with some crappy engineering, I agree, we could improve upon that. But I, I believe we have successfully showed the points like this kind of framework allow us to successfully communicate the task to the robot. Okay, thanks, uh, I will continue. Oh, question? Well, what kind of model do you have the optics, for example, the chest of drawers? If I did that, I'd pull the drawer out and fall and grab. So how does the robot, when you say pull it all the way out, actually that's bad. So like, what kind of model is there of those optics? So in this specific case, like the robot actually pulled drawer all the way out. So we have some like force guard, for example, if the, it has some like resistance from the drawers opening process, it will stop. So there's a, there's a catch on it, but the yes. robot doesn't know that. So, so the robots will continue to have some kind of for loop to continuously like, move the drawers out until a point that, for example, if it violates a force guard, it will stop. So that's the model. Yes, that's the model. Question? I just want to follow up on Chris. Mm -hmm. So like in general, this phenomenon of like very slow behavior is something you also see in other like L1 based demos. For example, from Google, they like 10x speed up all their, mm -hmm. all their demos. What is the real bottleneck? Is it querying the LLM that's so slow? Is it doing like like actually calling the low level motion primitive? Like what part of the stack is the engineering trick that will make it actually more real time? 
this is actually a very good uh, point. So currently, our main bottleneck is definitely not on the curing of LLM. Because in the end, what we curate will only be once. We only curate the large language model once. And this large language model will generate this code. And this code will generate this value map. So the mapping from the language instruction to the code is where we call the large language models. So we only call it once given this kind of language, uh, this task specifications. So that's not the bottleneck. The bottleneck, I believe, would still be our engineering of the robots that could, like, we could potentially move the robot faster. Another major bottleneck, I would say, is the calling of the vision language model. So although we only call the large language model once to generate this program, but the program will like repetitively call the vision language model to detect objects in the environment. So that can slow things a little bit. In this case, we were using like OWL VIT, which is reasonably efficient, but I believe some better versions nowadays uh, uh, already exist. Mm -hmm. well, now, now, now. So what, what the rights call is very high level. Mm -hmm. so the function and uh, so if you do multiple different tasks, it makes it's very high level, and you have to implement the actual action of the robot to have you, that's the actual action. So you're actually figuring out a lot of things that are how I am not telling you. It's just giving a hint, high level, and you have to actually go in to figure out everything yourself. Uh, actually, the output from the large language model is not very high level. It actually generates a code that can be executed directly by the robots. So specifically here, although what I'm showing here is rather high level, because this is our higher highest level like code generations. Like it is generating this code that calls this composer, but composer will call the large language model again to generate code that actually generates the value map. So it is actually a nested structures where the top level will call the large language model once, and we are recursively generating the codes by like um, generating functions for each and every one of this composer call. And composer call will call some other functions to and, and also curate a large language model to do this kind of recursive and nested code generations. Unlike the drawer, it actually is cool. Okay, it's cool to draw. But it's way to something else, it's different pooling. It's different. It may be totally different action, and you have to figure it out. It's, it's just kind of cool. Yeah, it can be totally different actions. And the uh, large language model will generate code that's trying to detect where the draw is and what is the axis is and what the direction is. Given those information, like each setup but the same code can generate different value functions that will end up um, generating different robot motions. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, question? So if you want to grasp the uh, drawer handle, mm -hmm. Uh, how do we know the exact grasp code? What if we try to go like this and that doesn't work? In this case, actually, like I said, we are generating not just the affordance map, not just the constraint map. We also have rotation map and gripper maps to tell the robots what should be the sixth of poles of the NA factors. So those information can be taken into account when generating this value map. They can specify the right orientations for the NA factor. The language model specifies that. And, and what information do you get? Do you get the bounding box of the handle? So, so, so this, so for this for this specific work, we use the GPT four V, GPT four instead of GPT four V. So the language models uh, doesn't take the foundation model doesn't take visual inputs as input, but the because like in this specific case, we can detect the handles. We can have a bounding box for the handles. We roughly know its orientations. So we can, so the generic code will specify the orientation of the NA factors perpendicular to that, uh, the rotation of the bounding box. Yes, and that bounding box is the bounding box. Um, the bounding box is detected over the 2D image, but because we have the depth cameras, so we can map that into the 3D space. And this is what then is the um, no, so the language model only takes in the, the language as input. The language model will take the language, the, the natural language instructions as inputs and generate the code and the code will be fixed, which I would say is actually a limitation of this work. But given the language inputs, the code is fixed. The code itself is figuring out what the value maps should look like. It is, will be calling vision language model of detecting what the bounding box should look like. And given the, uh, 
orientation of the bounding box, it is generating a specific orientation maps for the NA factors. The output of the prompting tells you detect the thing and yes, yes. Based on the detected bounding box, predict the orientation route. Uh, currently, the mapping is somehow uh, pre-coded. So we have the prompt. If we know the orientation of the bounding box, we know the orientations of the NA factors. That is not a learning process, but some kind of pre-coded process encoded into the prompt. So mm -hmm. you can see the prompt. Like, yes. Right? Yes. Yes. That that was uh, part of the prompts to the to the foundation model. Yeah. So I will continue. So for this specific work, the key insights is to use foundation models to harness the common sense knowledge learned in those foundation model for task specifications, and we use code as these intermediate representations to bridge the gap between foundation model and the robot actions. Because again, this is simultaneously. Large language model generatable, human interpretable, and robot executable. It allows future generalizations. Again, you have to give the foundation model something to get something back. So you have to give it examples. So this is actually a few short uh, learning process. And there are limitations. The first limitation is, is actually very limited in terms of spatial resolutions. And you have seen earlier, like we only like detect where the object is and return a smoothed out 3D value map. That is very limited in the resolution. Currently, we also is limited in terms of the dynamics modeling. So currently, when we plan the robot behavior, we typically only consider the kinematic constraints of the robot arm. We do not consider the dynamic constraints of the environment. So that is actually another very important missing piece. The third one is we assume like all objects are somehow observable. There's no exploration pro process inside this case where like we already supply the foundation model with a list of objects in the environment. And last, currently it's lacking feedback to the foundation model. Like I have answered questions earlier, the generated code is fixed given the natural language instructions, which is another very important limitations of this work. So in addressing some of these limitations, we'll go down to the following two works is on how we can use like uh, existing foundation models for this low level modeling of the environment as well as high level modeling of the environment to give you better spatial resolutions and allow the robot to be able to explore the environments to alleviate these assumptions on full observ observability. First is about low level modeling. The key questions we hope to answer is that how can we generalize over pixels and ground those information in a 3D space, which I believe 3D is extremely important for real world physical interaction tasks. Here will be some examples. Here will be a human. There are two like organized shoe. You realize there will be like some dynamic movements of the shoes on the rack. And also the movements is also 3D. It, move, it actually moves not just in a planner space. And also when you look at how the human is organizing the shoe, the humans are not organizing them in a random fashion. There's actually a rich semantic requirements when you organize those shoes on the rack. There again has been a lot of like uh, interesting and important uh, developments in the visual foundation model domain, like Sigmund Anything as well as Dino V2. But most of them are still inside this 2D space. And in this work, we hope to develop this field representation of the environment that is simultaneously 3D, semantic, and dynamic for the robot to do the downstream manipulation tasks. Here's how the system works. Given this 2D observations of the environment, like specifically multi-view, like visual observation of the environments, we'll first using those foundation model to obtain features, obtain segmentation masks from the input to the image. And then we will project those informations into the 3D space. Specifically, we leverage a field representations. Like for an arbitrary query point in a 3D space, we will aggregate the informations from multiple viewpoints and those informations will be composed together to obtain this 3D field representations. And this 3D field representations will contain the geometry and the 3D information, as well as the semantic information. Here, the semantic information I'm showing contains different levels of abstractions, the semantic as the instance level, as well as the semantic at the part level. The colorized like colon on the last shows like the uh, the 3D descriptor, the distribution of the descriptors over the RGB space, where the color are similar, meaning they are, they are close into this, uh, within this descriptor space, 
when color are different, they are further away in this descriptor space. You can see like the shoe tips and shoe heels are mapped into different colors, but the shoe tip of different shoes are mapped to the same color. Like using this kind of 3D descriptors, we can actually do some very interesting like curing, like dense curing experiments. Here, the task is given the reference image show on the top left. There's a red dot here that will obtain a reference feature. And on the right, we are showing the activations when we compare the query features with the dense feature field. You could realize if we place the points onto the bar of this mark, all the marks inside this like target images, actually they are actually in 3D, we projected them into this 2D image, will be light up. And when you place this um, dots into, for example, the rim of the mark, all the mark rims will be light up, showing a very strong category level generalization capabilities. One thing I want to highlight here is that there's no training at all in our systems. We just do zero short aggregation of those information and these types of generations comes for free. Here's another example shows some interesting properties of those representations. Like if you move this red dots like on the inner circles inside of this place, you realize like the activations actually captures this kind of rotational symmetry of this place. Well, you will be able to have activations maps that is circular on the target image. So I would call it both a feature and a bug, depending on how you are going to actually using this kind of correspondence information. And the third example, I would say is actually rather interesting. If you place this dot onto the head of this fork, you will realize the head of the fork in the target image is light up. You will realize that the target image and the input image, they are actually very different, very different in terms of their context. And the target image is actually in simulations. Again, there's no training at all. So the representation automatically generalizes across simulations and the real world. If you place the, head, the, the dots on the head, or the head light up. But as soon as you move the dots onto, for example, the bar of this fork, and all the bars, not only on the fork, but knife will be lined up. This shows some very fine grains, like distinctions between the bar and the heads of different utensils. And this it can be very helpful for you to do the downstream grasping or you task a question. My eyes are just bad. Is the fork on the hexagon plate not really a fork, so it's not lit up or something? What's going on? That's a very good observation. Uh, this is not lined up. Uh, partly, we assume it's because the fork is placed on, on, on the surface of this place, which indicates a different context compared to the query image. So that's why it didn't light that up. So this is like context dependent uh, descriptors that is not only considered the local geometry, but may also consider some like border context. Question? <laughs> So it's, it's all about dynamic So it's about dynamic performance and we aggregate them into this 3D space. So we are guaranteed it is like, for example, viewpoints uh, uh, equivalence. But, but the original, for example, dynamic if you change the viewpoints, the feature can change uh, to some extent. Yeah, yeah, dino is not working. And, and the reason we assume, we, we hypothesize why dino video wasn't working is because of the context. Yeah. And for example, if you move the dots into the uh, heads of the knife, also only the knife heads will be light up. But as soon as you move the dots into the body of the knife or the body of other utensils will be light up. How could this result be different if somebody yeah, what we found is that without this kind of aggregations, the results will be much less stable. Now we aggregate everything to this 3D space. So if you just carry on the 2D, depending on what kind of viewpoints you have, it will be very, very fuzzy locally. It will jump a lot. So this 3D aggregation gives you the stabilities and grounding over the 3D geometry of that object. So this is that we assume that you can see this thing from multiple calibrated points and you extract down and you average them in a 3D yes. feature map and then you project it back down to the 3D images to show those 2D Yes, yes, exactly. 
I see, but it would be nice to show them side by side the aggregate with the non aggregate signals, right? Yes, yes, you are right. Uh, we will add that type of results uh, later when I'm showing some additional results. We have four viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Okay, and because we have this kind of like dense uh, descriptors describing different part of these objects, so we can actually not only do correspondence spatially, but we can also do correspondence temporally. Here I'm showing like you can select a few key points on the shoes, you can actually nicely track the movement of the shoes over time. So that gives some kind of dynamic uh, properties and dynamic uh, characteristics for the representations. And here I'm showing a representation that is simultaneously 3D, semantic, semantic at different levels of semantics, uh, abstraction levels, as well as the dynamic property of the representations. Now we can use these representations for some control tasks. So specifically in this case, we consider some some target image. And the target image you are seeing here is actually a stylized image using this Van Gogh type of style. And this kind of mappings could be, uh, uh, then we can map this input image into this 2D descriptor maps using Dino. And then given the descriptor fields of the environments, we'll be able to find this correspondence between this 3D field as well as this 2D image. And this correspondence could be used as the objective functions to specify the laws for our planning task. And in this work, we consider a, a wide range of different objects and also task specifications in different types of images, images in simulation, images in the real world, or even AI generated images. So here will be the results. Like given the uh, target image, and we'll be able to reorganize this environment by matching the target image. You can see that the context will be different, the backgrounds are different, and the specific instances of the objects are also different. Here will be just some more examples where if you do different kind of tasks, uh, different type of specification for your target image, like the orientation, the swapping between the fork and spoons, the robots will all be able to do the tasks uh, with great uh, reliability. And not only uh, generalized uh, in the real world. We also like uh, specify the tasks in the real world, but task uh, mobile manipulator in simulations to reorganize, for example, the shoes, or for example, place different kind of objects onto the plates. The robot will be able to find this matching between this 2D image specifications as well as this 3D environments and be able to do all of those organization tasks, organizing foods, organizing marks, as well as organizing utensils. And with some additional capabilities on the dynamics model. So I have previously worked a lot on learning-based dynamics modeling. If you couple this kind of task specific specification with the neural dynamics models, you'll also be able to like uh, do the task like aggregating the, uh, the granular pieces as well as aligning the shoes. And to summarize a little bit, the structures we consider in this work is a representation that is simultaneously 3D, semantic, and dynamic. It allows zero show generalizations across instances as well as the contextual environments. It really leverages some of the advances in the visual foundation models and allows very flexible goal specifications across theme to real, of course, like in context and uh, and a context variations. You can also generalize to AI generated goal image. And we have an ongoing work here. I'm just showing you some uh, teaser results. Here is to lift this kind of representation further by doing imitation learning on top of that. For example, here is our training instances of two like spoons. And these two spoons will be, the, here's our demonstrations. We will provide demonstrations of using these spoons to scoop some kind of coffee beans. And because of this um, generalizable 3D representations of the environments, we'll be able to like uh, automatically generalize to other type of spoons the robots will be able to re recognize where's the bar, where's the head of this spoon, and be able to do certain levels of generalization. And one interesting thing is the focus on some important like pieces of this environment. For example, the this here the task is to pick up the knife. But to pick up the knife, you typically want to pick up from the handle instead of the blade. So this kind of features, this 3D uh, feature maps, this 3D, um, uh, fields will be able to hide the, re the regions that correspondence corresponds to the task relevant regions of this object. For example, here the task is to flip, like right, to pick up the coke can 
and place it um, uh, upright. It will be able to recognize where the, uh, the bar is and be able to do the tasks differently, even if the initial configurations are very similar to each other. Here's another example. If you want to, for example, squeeze some kind of toothpaste to the toothbrush, you will also be able to recognize where the head of that toothbrush is. And the head of this toothbrush will be taken into account by this imitation learning policy and be able to like, move the head of the toothbrush to the head of this toothpaste. Uh, we should really like squeeze some toothpaste out. Uh, we didn't do that, but you get the point. Meaning this kind of generalizable 3D field representations allows category level generalizations, both for task specification as well as for imitation learning. And you can also like review some subtle like visual um, appearances, like for example, the heads of this uh, toothbrush, as well as for example, the leads of this cold cans in order to successfully do the tasks uh, in a way that we want the robot to do. So uh, any questions? How do you know how, so right now you ask the large language model one question, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of these tasks actually require a deeper analysis. So lifting up that Coke can, uh, I've lifted up Coke can and squeezed too hard and I fall over the place. So that seems like a question to ask the large language model is what pressure, what force can I use on this particular object? I use the uh, toothpaste kind of example. It should know that it can be. I don't know, or even with the one hand, you might want to squeeze it and let it go on the table and then somehow. So the large language model might provide that kind of context where if you just ask it the once, it's fine. So how, how deep that is the question? That's actually a very good question. For this specific work, we circulate that question by using imitation learning. So this imitation learning are a few demonstrations that allow, allow the robot to know what should be the right ways of interacting with the environments instead of prompting the large language model to give this low level guidance. But I do believe the large language model can actually give some low level guidance and understanding of the environments. For example, we have a lot of common sense about objects like physical properties. If we see a gla glass like cup, we know it's fragile. If we see, for example, a cold can, we know it's slippery. If we squeeze it too much, it will slip out. So there's a lot of common sense information about those low level physics and low level um, ways of interacting with objects. Those haven't really been harnessed out. Uh, we are thinking along those directions and we are also working on some related uh, investigations, uh, but I, I'm, I haven't been very confident about showing like uh, new results in this talk, but I, I agree with you. There's a lot of like, low level task relevance and uh, physics relevant um, information we could potentially benefit from those foundation models. It's been my experience with large language models. It's not so much the first question, it's the follow up questions that are much more interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I, I saw it this year, I think, with the follow up questions about how to approach the cold can and how far to squeeze it, et cetera, uh, are, are really more interesting than the kind of the initial go. Uh, I also agree with you on that. Like for my personal experiences working with foundation model or playing with foundation model, sometimes the uh, like one shot output from the foundation model can often be wrong. So you sometimes want to ask some follow up questions, like in order to like over time it will converge to the right results or some more satisfying results. But this process, I would say, involves some like sequential decision makings because what kind of feedback do you give to those foundation models? That's our questions. And like, in what way to give that? feedback such that it can converge. Like we should have these intuitions. So like we are trained to work with foundation models by playing with foundation models. So uh, how we can do this autonomously? I think that's actually a very interesting question. Uh, what is the 3D representation that you are using that you are showing in this uh, video? Uh, specifically in this case, what we are uh, doing would be exactly the field representation I showed earlier which is 3D semantic and dynamic. It's just the learned policy. We'll be able to highlight different regions of this object. For example, this feature allows us to highlight the lead of this code can, such that we could like, the, the policy will take that into account. That amplifies the relevant information on the objects for the policy, for the policy to uh, generalize to different initial configurations. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will go to the, uh, the third piece of today's um, talk in regarding the foundation models opportunities for robotic manipulations. And third one will be this high level modeling. And specifically what we are 
thinking about this CAM foundation model help us understanding this larger scale structures of the environment, such that we'll be able to understand the object-object relationship as well as the effect of reactions. And in order to build this high level representation and modeling of the environment, there has been a lot of very nice um, works in the community. For example, works from MIT, from Luca Calon's lab on building this multi-level like thin graph representation of the environments, as well as this work on concept graphs that's trying to incorporate the knowledge from those big models and build out graph representations of the environments. But there is actually one very important missing piece of all of those like thin graph type of work, which is action. A lot of those works that consider the robots and navigating the environments, recognizing the objects, and trying to understand their spatial relationship. But if you really look at, especially some of the works, if you really look at how they are using the constructed graph for the downstream tasks, a lot of those tasks are only involved like object retrieval. Like object retrieval, frankly, May, re may, may not re really require to understand a very complicated relationship between objects because they just have to get closer to that object and you are by curing their graph representations. They really miss this important concept of actions to understand like if we want to find an object within a drawer, we have to actually open that drawer before we can retrieve that object. So this work, we really want to like leverage the power of foundation models and incorporate this concept of actions into this kind of thin graph representations of the environment. Specifically, here is our actually our motivating video from Tom and Jerry. If you look at what they're doing in this room, you'll realize they're actually exploring the environment. If we place a robot inside our homes, the robot will also first explore the environment before you can do something useful. And if you look at what they're doing, they're not doing the exploration in a random fashion. They understand what objects require explorations and how to explore that object. And after the exploration, they will also memorize the details of what has been explored. These are also common sense information, if you think about it. Like not all objects require exploration, and for specific objects, they are actually should be explored differently. A drawer should be explored differently than, for example, like a carpet. So this work we termed like robot EXP, action condition thin graph while interactive explorations for robotic manipulations leveraging the foundation models. Specifically, given this kind of tabletop environments, you realize there's a refrigerator. There's also like a cabinet with a lot of drawers where the robot don't know what's inside. Those are the things that requires explorations. The robot will first observe the environment and based on its observations, it will build some kind of scene graph representations of what are the objects in the environment. It will identify what object require explorations and explore those regions. And the exploration results will be updated on our scene graph show on the top left. And after the exploration, you will be able to realize where the forks are, where the condiments are. And then given this kind of scene graph, this kind of action condition scene graph, it will be able to understand if you want to reach this condiments, I do first open this drawer, be able to, before I can retrieve this condiments. And then it will be able to do this task and placing all the objects in the specified target configurations. And here's actually a very interesting thing. The task is not finished yet. There, the robot still has to place a spoon on the left side of this plate. But the robots can actually go through this kind of scene graph and realize, oh, there actually is no spoons inside this environment. It knows that because it explored the environment. So it will actually ask human for help. A human will come in, place a spoon on the left side of this plate. So it really knows what it's doing. It knows what's in this environment. If I want to do something, how can I find a specific object? The general framework works like this. You have we have our setup with like arms and so, and one wrist mounted mounted cameras, and we will like process this multi view RGBD informations using some open vocabulary object detector and segmenter, and those information will be aggregated into this three D representation of the environments. Or three D representation contains both low level geome geometric information as well as high level graph representation describing the action condition relationship between different entities. And then given this kind of graph, we will ask foundation models like GPT-4, like what objects, what nodes require expansion and how can we explain, expand a specific node? And then this action will be executed in the real world to do the explorations in the real physical environments. And for experiments, we consider three category of experiments. The first one will be obstruction. By obstruction, what we mean is that 
if you want to explore this cabinet, there is actually a condiment blocking the opening of the door. So the robot will actually be able to realize if I want to open the door, I actually have to move the condiment away before I can open the door. And after opening the door, it's realized there's a tape inside. It will be able to like update the scene graph and uh, assign this tape on the expanding nodes. And after this kind of explorations, it will understand what's inside each drawers and each cabinets. And we will be able to have this very nice low level like representations and memory of the environment. We could curate, okay, what is actually cabinet one, cabinet two, condiments, and also the hidden tape within this cabinet because we explore it. We know where its locations. We'll be able to place it inside those cabinets and also the drawers. So this is for obstructions. The second set of experiments we did was for recursive reasoning. So this really shows that we are not just curating the foundation model once and generating a fixed programs. We are constantly observing the environment and decide what to do at the current stage. For example, looking at this one, this is actually like a nested uh, Russian doll. The robot knows the Russian doll could be explored. And after one Russian doll, it realized that there are some more Russian dolls. It will be able to explore like recursively and be able to build this complete scene graph and also restore the Russian doll back in order to like recover the original states. So you'll be able to do nested explorations such that it really shows it is doing the decision making based on its current observations. And here's another example when it's like move the tiles away, it's find the Russian doll again and continually do the explorations. So it is using visual information as feedback and realize like what type of exploration should we do. So this really like address some of the limitations we talked earlier in Vox Poster, where the program is fixed based on the language instruction. And now the exploration is really based on the environmental feedback to the robots. And third, we also show like our systems can be robust to some external disturbance. Here, after the robots explore the cabinets, there's nothing on the, on the right side. It opens the left side. There is actually an object, uh, which is, uh, I think, I believe it's an orange on the left side. There'll be a person comes in and removes orange. And the robot will actually realize by tracking the movement of the hands to understand what regions of this environment has been disturbed. And then it will be able to, those regions will be labeled as uncertain. The robot will go to those places again and to update those, uh, the, the, the information on those regions. Another example is that after the robot explores the cabinets and a person will come seeing, uh, you, you will be able to see what the person will, will be doing. A person comes in and creates another cabinet there and the robots will realize, okay, those regions has to be labeled as uncertain and it has to explore uh, those regions and then also update the scene graph. And after you have this kind of scene graph, it will be able to understand if I have to retrieve this apple, I have to open this drawers before I can grasp that apple and it will be able to put all of the required fruits onto this plate. And to summarize a little bit, in this work, what we are doing is to leverage the structures inside this action condition 3D scene graph. And we use foundation model to identify what objects require exploration and understand how to explore them. And this is also a way to augment the foundation model with tools. And the tools we are using is this kind, this kind of scene graph. That like instead of like just us foundation model every step of what to do, we have this scene graph that will allow us to summarize the information from the environment for the robots to do like interesting downstream manipulation tasks. So, so far what I have discussed are opportunities of using foundation models in three different sections. That question? Mm -hmm. When the object will be an obstacle or not in the drawer versus it's still in front of the drawer but slightly more in front and then it's not an obstacle. So how can we tell those differences? That's actually a very good question. Like in this specific case, what we did was purely based on relies on the output from GP4V. If GP4V tells I have to remove this continent before I open the drawers, we do that. If it makes mistakes, uh, I, I will actually think like it will fail. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Examples 
that is actually a very good point. So we actually use this visual observations to query the GPT-4V whether, because we have this low level memories, so we'll have segmentation mask. So segmentation mask will be taken into account and consider whether there will be some kind of obstruction relationship. Oh, you said GPT-4V. Yeah, GPT-4V, yes. So it's just that. Yes. So it's a 2D image, not, not 3D there. It's 2D image. Yeah, but because we have wrist mounted camera, so you can move around. So we can have different kinds of viewpoints. You can actually query multiple times if you're uncertain. So mm -hmm. go back to this graph representation. Mm -hmm. um, what is the like, referring to the one like showing like twin clouds of the so like tapes in the in the, in the door, like. Um, so like if, if the robot like observes that like uh, tape like by like opening up the chest right like so maybe it registers that tape would be you know uh, somewhere outside of the chest right and then it pushes in like then it like registers that kind of information. Oh, that will involve some online tracking. We didn't do that. We just if I see it and I will know it will be pushed back. Well, we will update because we know how far we pull the drawers out and we know how far we push it in. So we'll just instantiate the, the objects, the observations into the, 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 the closed, the, the regions after the drawers is closed. Mm -hmm. The thing I have is like, when you, when the human removes like a hook right from mm -hmm. the, um, the door, right? Like, I guess like, why, why is it the case that the, the, the robot conscious like observing like the human taking this out of it, right? Like just know that the, that object has disappeared from the ground. That's a good, good point. That will also involve some real-time tracking. You want to track the movements of the code cam before you know it's actually been moved away. So here we only detect, okay, that area has been intervened. So that area has been labeled as uncertain. So we explore that environment again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I will very quickly summarize some of the challenges I still see in the area of foundation models, specifically in its understanding of geometric, physical, and embodied interactions. This is actually a very interesting example. I know the text is a bit small, so I will repeat what happens here. The left image, you give GPT-4V an image, and you ask it which angle is larger, A or B. The, the GPT-4V told, told us actually uh, angle A is larger than angle B, which is incorrect. For the second example, you ask which one is longer, A or B. This is just this is a very, very simple task. But the foundation model just tells us uh, they are of the same lens. This is probably because it is very familiar with this kind of visual illusions of this, which one is longer or shorter. So it just tells it's, it's the same. And also, Sora, absolutely amazing. Very amazing video generation results. But if you really look into understanding their geometric consistency, you will actually find out, okay, some of the projective geometries are actually incorrect. And also some other more embodied interactions. This is what um, we are doing in the lab. We are curing or stress testing the capability of the foundation models. Here the task is given this kind of cabinets. Here are some directions you could potentially explore. You could interact with this handle of this uh, refrigerators. Like which direction should you pull? gpt we just said yellow and green and yellow. So random. So supposedly this is actually a very, very simple task. You, you, you thought, okay, this is very simple. We can look at it. So I know we know it. Like you should just pull it uh, along the directions that's, that's, uh, uh, that's perpendicular to the, to the surface. But the GPT-4V just don't understand those kind of physical interactions. So in addressing these limitations, it's lack of understanding about the geometric, physical, and embodied interactions. I believe it's extremely important to couple the foundation models, for example, with action condition dynamics model, which have always been um, developing in our lab of trying to learn dynamics of the environments for complicated objects, for complicated physical interactions, for the uh, robots to plan its behavior to make interactions with the environments. So this understanding about dynamics, I think should complement what our current foundation models is doing. And even for Sora, it is amazing, but it's not action conditions. So the use of Sora in robotics is still uncertain. So how to inject this concept of actions is actually one very important question. And second question is the understanding of the uh, tactile or some other modality of the information. Current foundation models consider for them visual information like language uh, um, uh, informations, 
But for physical interaction, touch can play an extremely important role. Like during my PhD, we have a nature paper that developed this tactile glove. And we already reproduced like similar sensors at UIUC and attach that to this robot fingers. They'll be able to give you dense tactile information on the palm area. Here in trying to understand like the in-hand state of this rope uh, when you, for example, trying to stretch it. And here is actually the tactile signals we are getting from the reproduced tactile sensor. And also another thing I think could be very important is not just to do reinforcement learning from human feedback, but to do reinforcement learning from embodied feedbacks. This is a very a work I really like um, here at CMU. You're trying to use this robot arm to go around and open all different kinds of drawers and doors. So I believe be able to have this embodied interactions in the loop of the training process for the foundation model is extremely important to endow the existing foundation models with this geometric and interactive understanding about its actions. So last, I want to thank all my collaborators on the work I've shown before. Without them, it will be impossible to do all these works. And this will be the summary slides and happy to take any questions. Right, next time, we get like we really around all the time. So if you have questions, feel free to email in and it's very nice to respond to emails. So yeah, thank you. Please send me emails if you have any questions. Thank you.